This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week, our episode is chock full of a lot of really great stuff that you're going to really enjoy, I'm sure. A couple of things up front I would like to announce. First of all, uh, Neil Turton had written me to tell me a little bit of magic news that I don't know has been published much anywhere else, but I know we have a lot of listeners who are interested in mentalism, mind reading, and particularly in wallets, particularly as they uh, refer to peak wallets and the like. Anyhow, he was saying that there's a new website out that uh, is called the Chamber of Wallets, and it's very useful for magicians and mentalists, and it's at chamberofwallets.com, and essentially it's an A to Z index of not only wallets, but peak devices, coin holders, and deck holders, and there are over, currently, there are over 220 listed on that website. Uh, the user, users can go back to the uh, A to Z index page, and on that site they'll be able to see everything that's listed in alphabetical order. And uh, each one has its own page and its own description, photos, forum links, and YouTube videos where it's discussed or reviewed. Hopefully, this will be helpful to buyers who are interested in getting the right wallet for the right situation. Also, as uh, new wallets, peak wallets, and coin holders and deck holders are released, then they will be added as time comes on. I would also say they plan on updating this with new features that will include a search engine, a blog, and also some details, more details, of product launches and competitions. So, anyhow, thank you very much, Neil, for letting us know about that. And, again, you can check that out at chamberofwallets.com. So, I would recommend going and taking a look at that. Also, this week we are announcing a new contest. Michael Breger is one of the friends of the Magic Word, who is one of our patrons. And he is also a regular contributor to the Linking Ring, to the card section. And he has a couple of books that are out. And if you become a friend of the Magic Word at certain donation levels, you can receive a free ebook just by helping us each month with your financial pledge. He has a new book called Take Five, and he's wanting to offer this to the listeners, to whoever would like to buy one. They typically sell for $12, but he has them available for $8. If you will just email him at mbregermagic, that's B-R-E-G-G-A-R, magic at gmail.com, and uh, you can buy one there. But wait, it's an even better deal. You can get one for free, possibly. (laughs) Let me say, there's a chance to win one for free because we are starting a contest this week where you can actually enter a contest and win one of two free eBooks or perhaps a physical copy as well. We'll talk more about that on the back end of this podcast after this is over. This week, we are going to be traveling to Pitch and Forge. We're going to try something that we haven't done before, and that is an audible tour of, of some place. In other words, you're going to have to use your imagination as you're listening to this to imagine what we are seeing. I think we get pretty accurate descriptions as we are going through this uh, mansion. And let me back up a little bit to say that we will be speaking here then with Terry Evanswood in Pigeon Forge. And he lives in and has been developing and remodeling. I wouldn't say remodeling, but I guess just kind of repairing some of the damage, I guess, to this old mansion that was built back in 1840. And it's uh, it's phenomenal. And he does give private tours for this. You can check that out, and uh, he can give you a tour of this, so you can uh, see this whenever you happen to be in the area of Pigeon Forge. It's outside of town a little bit, but it's uh, well worth the drive. It's amazing, and uh, here this week, you'll get to hear a little bit, of, well, actually quite a bit, about each of the rooms and the different artifacts he has in the rooms, and we're, he's, he's so detailed that we're not going to be able to squeeze it all into this week's episode, just into one episode, so we're going to carry on the second part of that into next week then as well. So again, I'm going to step out of the way and uh, introduce uh, Terry. Imagine that we have just pulled up the driveway. There's a long driveway. We have parked in an adequate space, walked around up to the front door, onto the porch, uh, opened the door, and he has welcomed us into the foyer of the Magic Mansion. So please welcome my guest here this week, Mr. Terry Evanswood, here on The Magic Word.
So we are at Magic Mansion, which was originally the home of John and Mary Ellis. They had a 400-acre plantation here in Sevier County, and this property was the centerpiece of it. Uh, it was completely built out of brick that were handmade. The brick and pack it into wooden boxes it was given to me by the Historical Society. So this is really a treasure to me. The clay was packed into the boxes, dried in the sun, uh, and fire kilned right here on the property one by one. And it took seven years to build the house. The uh, groundbreaking was in 1832, and it was completed in 1840. So really quite a project. You know, in, in that time, it would have been a glorified farmhouse, really. Uh, but at this point, with my interests and collections, the uh, antique collections, both in historical and magic collections, it's all decorated in a Victorian period, which would have been kind of the Gilded Age, the late 1800s. Uh, my parents lived in St. Charles, Illinois, which was 40 miles west of Chicago and home to one of America's largest indoor-outdoor flea markets, the King County Flea Market. And the first weekend of every month, my father and I, as he said, we would flee to the flea. <laughs> and it was a running joke every, every uh, month. I'd say, Dad, what are we looking for? And he'd say the same thing. Well, we're looking for the same thing we were looking for last month. We're looking for something that we didn't know we couldn't live without. And, uh, and we found it by the truckloads. So 40 years of flea marketing has accumulated into this collection. And, you know, honestly, I, I didn't know why I was collecting it all. It was just things that spoke to me. And now it all makes sense. Uh, everything has fallen into place perfectly. Uh, the house has just um, really been a blessing. The house is actually built in two eras. The first half that we're going to go through the historic part of the house is the 1840 section. Then in the 1970s, the Stennett family added an, um, kind of an opposite addition. The first part of the house is an L shape. Mm -hmm. And then in the 70s, they added an opposite L to rectangle the building. Uh, the first family being Ellis. The second family, the Wideners, had it for two generations. And then the Stennett family, I mentioned, they, they raised their three sons here, all police officers, and they live right behind me. In fact, I, ha I have three police officers behind me. I've got a paramedic on the left. I've got a Baptist preacher on the right. And Tammy, some of you may remember my longtime 20-year assistant, Tammy, lives right across the street. So I feel very loved and protected. It's a, <laughs> it's a perfect spot. Just worked out great. So the second half of the house tour is the collections, movie memorabilia, historic um, relics, religious relics, and sideshow circus memorabilia. Uh, the Willy Wonka room, I think you'll enjoy. Yeah. And uh, and then we always end the tour here with the public with the 20-minute magic show in the home theater and uh, out the door. So, so this is actually part of a real tour that you promote? Yes, yep. So what we do, I have the magic show through the week here in Pigeon Forge. And in fact, you know, we're starting our 27th year here uh, that begins this Saturday, our first show of 27 years. And I, it's amazing because I'm only 19, so I don't know, don't know how that how happens. That, it's, the math it, just doesn't work. It's an illusion. Or it's, it's a delusion. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a delusion. Excellent. Well, let's go into the first room. Sounds good. So uh, in the parlor, uh, the welcome room is a collection of Victorian furniture. Everything is extremely uncomfortable. Uh, that's just <laughs> how it was back then. All the furniture is very short and very uncomfortable, but it looks the part. And of course, we all know that's what counts. Uh, the piano, you know, we're, let's come over and I'll, I'll tell you about the piano. The piano was made by the Chickering Company in 1926, which is easy for me to remember because, of course, that's the year that Harry Houdini died. Mm -hmm. um, it was made uh, by one of America's premier piano manufacturers and joined forces with a company called Ampico. Ampico uh, that was a group of geniuses who'd get together every month over coffee and discuss what would be impossible to build. And one guy recommended, why don't we make a piano that plays itself? So when the laughter subsided, you know, they thought, well, that's quite a challenge. And they did it. So they married kind of what I would refer to as an aftermarket unit uh, into the Chickering piano. So I'll turn it on and hopefully we will hear some music from the past. The, the music that you're hearing is a cut of Liberace. He performed about 20 songs for the Ampico Company, and this is the theme from The Godfather.
So the, uh, the the songs that were done by Liberace was um, pretty clever. It's what we call a four-hand roll. Whenever you see a player piano playing more notes than humanly possible, uh, chances are it's a Liberace roll. Like musicians do today where they'll layer music. Right. He recorded the first cut and then had them rewind it and played harmony against himself. And the special thing about the uh, Ampico system for the player pianos um, it's what we call a reproducer. It's not just hitting the notes, but actually the inflection of the artist, the sustain and the pressure of the keys. It's a pretty amazing instrument, and I'm really, I really, really enjoy wow. it. Wow. Yeah, sometimes after the show, I'll, I'll come home and light the oil lamps and <laughs> grab a glass of wine and dim the lights, and it's like you're back in time. And this, a lot of people refer to this, and I agree, as a time machine. Yeah. And, yeah. And so is this electric then, or how is it, it actually? It is electric. Mm-hmm. Um, everything else in the room is uh, mechanically driven uh, in an era before batteries or electricity. The the player piano, this particular one, you'd have to have pretty deep pockets and, and obviously electric in your home to sure. run this uh, in a time when electric hadn't reached rural areas yet. Mm-hmm. So one of my other favorite um, music machines over here, this is the uh, Edison, as he called the talking machine. I'm going to wind this up. And for those of you who are familiar with the old clocks, uh, it's spring-driven. So as you wind up the machine, it tightens a spring, a coil. Not really a spring like we think, like a slinky, but mm-hmm. more of a, a coil of metal. So when you take the brake off of this, it's now turning the cylinder disc. Those are made of wax. And it has the same effect as a modern you know, LP flat record, but in this case, it's a cylinder. And when you set the needle on the record, what we're about to hear is a voice that's not been heard in over 100 years. Edison was also smart enough not only to record great music of the time, but also um, great voices. Mm -hmm. Before this machine, the only way you could hear anything was live. It couldn't be recorded. Uh, Wonderful invention. So he he recorded voices like um, Alexander Graham Bell, of course, the man who created the telephone, P.T. Barnum, which I'm really thankful to have because I'm a, as you'll find out soon, I'm a huge P.T. Barnum fan. You might even say obsessed, and that might be the correct word. And uh, Harry Houdini's voice, uh, introducing the torture cell. So I'm going to play for you his voice. Edison recorded his own voice. I don't know if you can hear the clock in the background. I do. (laughs) I I love that sound. Also, you know, wound like the music machines, spring-driven. So uh, Edison recorded his own voice. I'm going to tell you ahead of time what it says, because it's a little scratchy, of course, and hard to hear, but a real treasure. He says, the first words I spoke in the original phonograph, a little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb. something that is amazing that was edison's voice edison's voice and i keep edison's picture nearby Mm -hmm. because you know when you go back to this time without video photography or film you know this is before the advent of any kind of film the best we can do now if we're lucky to hear the voice you can marry it to a picture and really get a feeling for what that person was like Uh, and likewise i do this in the barnum room with pictures of barnum and his voice and you can kind of get a flavor of what his personality was so we're going to go over That's here. Right. I'd, I'd like to show you the other music machine, which is the Edison phonograph. This was the second uh, kind of the, the creation that came after the talking It's like machine. a gramophone, the kind yeah. that the dog would listen into. It. Yeah, exactly, yeah. with the big horn. The horn was, of course, the speaker. That was the, the best concept at the time. At this point, records are flat. You wind it up just like we did the uh, Edison talking machine and turn it on. And here's 1920s music now. Picture the flappers dancing. We're just thinking that. <laughs> and, you know, being portable, you would take this to the beach. This was um, like a cassette player when I was growing up, the boom boxes. Boom box, this right. was the boom box of the 1920s. It's pretty amazing. Wow. So there's a cabinet here 
with collections of relics that I've been very fortunate to find in, out, through, and under the house, and metal detecting in the yard. Metal detecting, I found horseshoes, pony shoes, farm implements, hundreds of square-headed nails. The square-headed nails had to be made one by one by the local blacksmith. It wasn't like you could go to the store and buy a box of nails. So those were pretty valuable at the time. In fact, interesting side note, if you lived in an average wooden farmhouse and you were going to move, you would intentionally burn the house down. And then sift through the ashes to, to pick the out the nails because you could get that. yeah you could get wood any day of the year but it was the nails that were hard to come by. Wow! I also found a lot of these items that are on the next shelf. Uh, a lot of items that I found in and under the house in the fruit cellar and crawl space: bottles, perfume bottles, uh, doorknobs, keys, shoe buckles, some original silverware from the late 1800s that would have been used by the original family here. There's broken china, uh, marbles from the 1920s. And another a piece I recently found in the corner. This is a um, this is the hopper from the top of a coffee grinder. Mm -hmm. You put the coffee beans in there and grind the coffee. Uh, and on the top shelf is one of my favorite pieces. The uh, the Stennett family I referenced earlier. They're still living right behind me, and they came over to see the progress on the house. And when Mr. Stennett walked in, he asked his grandson. He said, "Do you still have the bullet?" Now, I knew the story, and I'm, I'll point out to you and our listeners, uh, I'm very fortunate that the original front door is still here. Uh, no one has changed out that door. All the, the doors, the molding, the fireplaces, uh, there's eight fireplaces, five chimneys, 40 windows that have all been needed to be replaced. I've done one. I have one window done. I have 39 to go. So this, <laughs> this is a lifetime commitment. It sounds like a is. real commitment. But no one's changed out the door. Um, so the reason that's incredibly special, about knee level in the door, there's a hole that's been patched. That was a hole from a bullet that was shot um, during the Civil War. Mr. Stennett found the bullet lodged in the wall behind me, and he asked his grandson, he said, do you still have the bullet I gave you? And the kid said, yeah. And he says, well, don't you think Terry should have it as part of his collection? And the kid said, no. <laughs> He said, go get the bullet. So the, the bullet was reluctantly given back to the house, and it's a wonderful part of the story in the history of the building when people come to see the house. Uh, to answer your question earlier, we, we have the magic show in town, but then every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday at 7 o'clock is the public house tour. And I was so, so blessed to find out when I was looking at purchasing the building, uh, the, um, the local zoning commission, I went to see if I could open for, you know, light mm -hmm. commercial use. And I, they said, well, I don't understand what, what will it be? And I said, well, it, it's, it would be a historic house tour. And so they looked in the computer and he said, we don't have any historic house tours. Um, so we'll just make a category. And they did. And here's your permit. Have fun. There go. <laughs> so uh, I've been doing the public tours for about a year and a half. Okay. And, so fairly um, new. Yeah. Right. And. Really, it's been so much fun. I enjoy the house tours and the show here just as much as the stage show. Sound like David Copperfield. That's one of those things that he, <laughs> yeah, you know, he loves yeah. showing his sure. museum, certainly, because it's a passion. It's something yeah, he's collecting. I don't understand you know? why some collectors don't share their collections, and it doesn't make any sense to me to hoard things and not share them. Part of the, the joy of collecting is you know the camaraderie that's created by sharing the collections, mm -hmm. especially for people that have an interest. And I'm noticing the amount of young kids, it's uh, refreshing for me to see the amount of teenagers who actually put their phone down and listen and they're like, wow, and get an appreciation for history. Because I truly believe, like we all know, if we don't have an appreciation, understanding for the, the past, um, it will repeat itself. That's true. Yeah. So the, the next room is the library, and uh, there were shelves in here when I first got the house. And so all of the magic books that I used to create the show are on the right side of the room. And on the left, a uh, special interest of mine, like I mentioned, P.T. Barnum, uh, Walt Disney, big Disney fan, of course, Robert Ripley, and Sideshow, Circus and Sideshow are some of my passions. But the room is full of the trappings of an illusionist lifetime, uh, strange and unusual things, you might say. 
when Franz Harari walked in here, he said this was Magic Castle East. Um, <laughs> That's the first thing I said when John, yeah. John Armstrong about that. Said it looks like Irma's room. In yeah, there. yeah, right. Yeah, the <laughs> piano that plays itself. Yeah. Unfortunately, this one doesn't take requests, but. <laughs> But uh, there's a few ghosts around here. You know, that's one of the questions people ask often, is the house haunted? And I, I've had a roommate that's lived here for 300 years, and he's never seen a thing. So. Okay. At least not that he's told you. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, to be honest with you, there have been some unusual um, unusual occurrences in the house. And lucky, a couple of them happened while guests were here. So they've signed the guest book with what they've seen or heard. Uh, you know, I, I never really, being a magician, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we all have answers. We like to solve puzzles. Uh, we have a, a solution to everything. And I never really, of course, I believe in the afterlife, but I never really had a handle on whether there could be, right, it, you know, residual energies left behind. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to admit, after having lived here for six years, um, I'm a believer. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I've got to ask them, what is the most odd thing that you have seen or that the uh, guests have seen that they've written? The most uh, incredible experience I had was in the library here. Uh, I, I've been doing all of the work, uh, not hiring out work. I enjoy construction and remodeling. I, I do a little bit of plumbing and electric. And, of course, my first plumbing attempt here was not a success. And That's a whole other story. Yeah, sounds I don't like. want to get into that. <laughs> but, the you know, a lot of these projects that I was doing early on, and one of them was refinishing the floor, the hardwood floor. It's beautiful tongue and groove floor that was done by John Ellis. John not only had the plantation here, he owned the sawmill on Boyd's Creek, the highway we're on. He had the riverboat trade here on the French Broad River. He built the Presbyterian Church that's just kitty corner across the street. In fact, it's still standing, and the same iron church bell still rings every Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. So it's fun when I hear that and know that's exactly the sound that the family heard here in the, in the 1800s. But um, I wanted to get the floor back to the condition that it was. And when I first found the house, all of the rooms were shag carpeting and, and paneling. That was just how it was from the 70s. And every time I'd pull a piece of paneling or rip up a piece of carpet, so thrilled to see that the original structure and the um, condition that it, that it was in, in very good condition. But this particular room in the library had to be refinished. So I had sanded down the floor, and it was 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm working by myself. And, uh, you know, usually I play music because just like the magic show, I'm very inspired by music. Mm -hmm. So music will lead the show. And that's how I am when I'm working. If I'm working on a Disney display, of course, you're going to listen to Disney music. If I'm working in the 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 uh, parlor, I'm listening to classical music. But for whatever reason, I wasn't listening to anything. I was just silent in my thoughts and kind of so excited, of course, about the new work and what the next project would be. And as I got to staining the floor right before I was getting into the next room, I was down on the ground, and I, I, I heard as clear as I'm talking to you now, I heard two words, thank you. And I just said, you're welcome, and kept working. And the, I think the scariest part of the whole thing was it wasn't scary. Mm -hmm. It just felt so natural like a friend saying yeah that. It, it it didn't now later i was like oh my god <laughs> you know as i look back at that but in the moment it was perfectly natural interesting so it was something you audibly heard it was not something in your mind that you right okay i'm with you great yeah so a lot of interesting things here yeah i see the sarcophagus and uh it looks like the uh, fireplace fireplace has been repurposed with a chair and everything mm -hmm. over here too yeah, all the fireplaces had been bricked over. There's eight fireplaces, as I mentioned, and I'm restoring them as I go. Um, I haven't done the one here in the library. It's kind of a it's, a, it's a big undertaking. But in this room are things that I had left from a haunted house project that I did. After going to Disney World, found that I was a big fan of Disney's Haunted Mansion. Haunted Mansion, right. As I'm sure you are and most of our <laughs> listeners. Right, exactly. You know, because the, the Haunted Mansion is basically a ride-through magic show. Mm -hmm. And so well done. And so it inspired me to create a haunted house in my hometown that ran for 15 years every October. When I sold that project, when I moved to Pigeon Forge to concentrate on the show here, I took some of my favorite items out. And so some of the furniture in this room, the oil paintings, uh, the suit of armor, sarcophagus, 
These are things that came out of the Haunted House project. And two of the oldest things in the house are in this room. Uh, over the door, there's a gun Since rack. Since I walked in, I yeah. guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, three of the oldest things. In the, um, the, uh, the gun rack over the door is hand-carved black forest wood from Germany. Mm-hmm. And um, that dates 1780. 1780. Wow. I mean, that's, that's, that's old. And behind us, there's a grandfather clock. This was the first floor model grandfather clock. And uh, this is also German. It still works. It'll never keep time anymore. In fact, it, we're going to open it up and maybe our listeners can hear the... So that, that sound... You can't wind it and get it to go that... Uh, you you can with the weights, but the uh, the mechanism it just won't keep time anymore. But it's interesting. A lot of people think that the uh, one of the hands is broken. There's only one hand on the clock. Well, they hadn't created uh, a minute hand. It was just an hour hand. So you would estimate the time. Mm-hmm. If the hand was between two numbers, you you knew it was the half hour. Uh, but it does ring. It has not a gong, but uh, a bell, not unlike a train bell. Uh, that could be heard throughout the house. Wow. This item is dated 1760. This clock is older than our country. Wow. And this came from where again? This came from Germany originally and yeah. somehow worked its way across the pond and ended up at Magic Mansion. So let me take you into the dining room and give okay. you kind of a visual of what's going on here. Someday maybe I can tell you my story about the Black Forest. Speaking of that, I had a particularly creepy incident that happened. In the Black Forest. Oh, really? was, yeah, pretty supernatural. So you're a believer. Hmm. Of okay. sorts. <laughs> of sorts. Yes. The uh, the dining room um, really didn't look much like it does now. I, I kind of redid this whole area in a Victorian period uh, with flocked wallpaper like they would have had. It was a reproduction that was made for me by a Hollywood set designer. In brothels, I guess. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's pretty much that look. So now you can visualize that. I'll give you a little word picture of yeah. the of the room. The ceiling is gold. There's a, a beautiful Austrian crystal chandelier in the centerpiece of the room and a table for 12. The china on the table is called King's Crown. It was popular in the late 1800s as well. It's identified by a red ruby top and um, that represents the crown of thorns. And then there's a thumbprint design that circles underneath the, uh, the rim that is a reminder that we're all individual, unique, and one of a kind. So it's got a beautiful religious undertone. Um, It's a perfect uh, accent for this room. The room is red and gold, so it all blends together very nicely. And um, behind us, there's a staircase that I had recreated. The original staircase when I found the house was a typical spindle staircase. And I found these beautiful hand-carved oak balustrades from France, not far from the Biltmore. Have you have you been to the Biltmore? I have been to the Biltmore. Okay, some of our, our listeners, I'm sure, have seen the Biltmore. People walk into this room and they'll say, this reminds me of the Biltmore. And I always say, well, I, I call this the Biltless. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's a great compliment. But uh, now the staircase is um, very Victorian and accented and hand-carved. It mm-hmm. um, looks like it was always here. Beautiful. Yeah. Now is this the, painting anything? It, it is not. Uh, okay. It's just a, a painting that I found that seemed to fit the theme. It does. The colors nice colors and, and everything. I mean, the feng shui a floral fits pattern. perfectly in here. And under the painting, there is a uh, kind of a throne chair. That's where I sit to have my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And there's a bell <laughs> There's a bell pull if you, if you listen. For the uh, valet or yeah, for the that's, butler? Yeah, that's to call the butler. No one ever comes running, but it's my dream, so I'm good with that. <laughs> oh, I got to hear. Listen to this. We're going to open the door that goes into the kitchen. This door was from my childhood favorite restaurant, about five minutes from where I grew up, and it still has the same creak. When they tore down the building, I couldn't get there quick enough to snag the door. So the same hinges and everything. Yep, okay. yep. Just just brings me right back to my childhood. So do you dine here I mean, very often? I mean, like Thanksgiving, I assume, and you have some friends yeah, over? Yeah, we, or... uh, we have dinner parties regularly. My family will come in for the holidays. The first dinner party we had was for the Stennett family that lived here. 
And um, when Mrs. Stennett walked in and saw the condition of the dining room, she slapped her husband and said, why did you sell this place? <laughs> I said, well, I didn't know it could look like this. But, you know, we're in the theater business, and uh, I love making a dollar look like a hundred. And uh, these are all things that I found literally junking and antiquing and gifts from other people, from fans and friends of the show. Mm -hmm. And it just has accumulated into um, what is appropriate for that period. I imagine that's the case when you have people who come out now and have seen the tour saying, oh, I can help you. You know, I can add. And they do. Originally, <clears throat> we're talking about the King's Crown Glass. I wanted to have 14 full settings. In, in case a guest at a dinner party broke something, I could just say, look, we've got more and get through that awkward situation. Right. So I'd mentioned to every house tour, if anyone sees this King's Crown China, grab it, send it to me, I'll pay you or send me pictures of what you find. If it's flea market, garage sale, antique shop, you know, yard sale. And I, I'll just, I tell people now, I, I don't need any more. There, there are over 300 pieces of this China <laughs> they've between been, the cabinets. They've been, yeah, they've been very generous. Yeah. yeah, Things keep coming. So now we'll take a Walk upstairs. Looks like about what, thirteen steps? Yes. <laughs> Which is typical. So the uh, the two the two guest rooms on this side of the house are themed. The first room is the Titanic, Titanic suite. Room. So if you listen closely, it sounded something like this: <laughs> Women and children first. <laughs> women and children. I should rephrase that. Rich women and children first. <laughs> so the Titanic room is the, the size, colors, and patterns of a suite on the Titanic. And um, there's yeah, some, hear the waves. Yeah, there's wave sounds in the background. And um, the, uh, a lot of the artwork in the room was done by friends of mine who do particular work. I thought it'd be funny to have a water bed in this room. <laughs> That's going just seemed one pretty, step too far. Seemed pretty all right. Yeah, yeah, pretty appropriate. <laughs> um, so the the clock over the bed is a half scale replica of the clock that was on the grand staircase of the Titanic that an artist friend of mine did for the room, and I purposely have it stopped at the time the staircase would have slipped underwater and the clock would have stopped. Actually, I'm, the truth is I'm tired of climbing up there to change the batteries, so I had to come up with <laughs> some reason good. why. And there's a painting of Captain Smith. Captain Smith was 40 years maritime service with no incidents or accidents, perfect unblemished record, and the White Star Line asked him to sail the Titanic to America, and he declined. And they kept after him about it, and finally he accepted. And can you imagine in his position after 40 years, his final trip, and this happens. You're Was standing, the final trip? Yeah, permanently. standing there holding the wheel as as the water is rushing around your ankles is just mm -hmm. so unfair. But I'll tell you what was really amazing for me when James Cameron's movie came out. Mm -hmm. uh, we found out that we actually had a Titanic survivor in my hometown. Oh my gosh! So I reached out to her and uh, I I just I looked her up back then. It was the you had to do your let your fingers do the walking. You know, right, you the yellow the pages at sure. that point. And I looked her up and called her, and I, I introduced myself and invited her to dinner and asked her if I could take her to dinner. And she said, no, uh, but you can come to my house for tea. So I sat with her for two hours, and she told me her mother's firsthand recollection. She was only three months old at the time, but she was there and survived the Titanic. And two months after we met, she passed. So it was really a, a blessing and a, just an amazing opportunity to meet the, the last American survivor of the Titanic. We have a Titanic exhibit here in Pigeon Forge that's uh, really one of our top attractions with relics from the ship. There's a man named Lowell Lytle. He was an actor, and he plays the part of Captain Smith on the Titanic exhibit. He came to see the show, and we had a great conversation after because he was a magician when he was a kid. Oh. So we became fast friends, sure. and he brought an incredible gift to me. He actually went on an expedition with Robert Ballard, the man who had had the technology in the 80s to go down to the Titanic, went through a seven-hour trip through the wreckage, and they found a stateroom window, which they hadn't found yet, brought it to the surface, and when they brought it out of that metal basket to take it into the conservator's room, the window hit the edge of the door, and little pieces of rust fell off onto the onto the deck mm. and he asked Robert Ballard if he could take them and he said why not it's just going to get washed off 
you know. So he took a handful of these and he gave me one. So in, in the case behind us is an actual piece of the Titanic. Wow. And like I said, it's just a piece of rust, but yeah. it was there that night. Uh, and that's just a bit. There's also a piece of coal from the wreckage and a White Star fish knife, not from the Titanic, but from the sister ship, the Olympic, which was being built at the same time. Uh, one of the stories that is amazing that some of you may have heard of, but it still gives me chills. Uh, I'm holding a copy of a book that was written in 1898. 1898 is 14 years prior to the conception of the Titanic. It's a book, a fictional book, about the world's largest ocean liner sailing to America, hits an iceberg, resulting in a serious loss of life because of lack of lifeboats. And if that's not enough, the title of the book is The Wreck of the Titan, T-I-T-A-N. I think I have heard this story, and the that's the story. Titan. That's it. That's it. And this is in the Library of Congress. I can't make this stuff up. Yeah. I mean, that's the perfect example of life imitating art. Wow. So that was the Titanic room, and so this is? This is the P.T. Barnum room. And if you listen closely, we can find the... Uh, the circus, the circus music in the background, and we'll have a chance to meet P.T. Barnum. Or not. And uh, <laughs> we're going to hear his voice also that was part of uh, one of the recordings that Edison did. This is the smallest room in the house, yeah, but by far my favorite. Uh, the wallpaper is original from the 1930s. It's a big floral pattern. The colors in here are kind of a colonial green. Uh, the ceiling and the floors are all original. Uh, the floors beneath us are the wide plank floors, mm -hmm. unlike the tongue and groove floors downstairs. Upstairs, you don't have to impress your guests. These are living spaces for the family. Mm. And if you look closely, we notice that there are square-headed nails showing. There are over 300 square-headed nails just in this room alone. So you can imagine the time and energy that it took to make uh, a home back then. The artwork on the walls are primarily two people. All the male pictures are Barnum, of course, and the female picture is Jenny Lind. Jenny Lind was the Swedish nightingale, he called her. She uh, was an opera singer. Until Jenny Lind, opera was not heard of in America. Barnum hired her to come to America for $1,000 per performance in the mid-1800s. Wow. Unprecedented amount of money. 150 concerts, $150,000 um, agreement they had. When she arrived in America, 30,000 people were on the dock cheering for her and no one had ever heard her sing a note. Barnum later uh, admitted he had never heard her sing. Um, <laughs> Edison had not created the phonograph. He just took a leap of faith and, uh, and um, it hit a win. In fact, the book he wrote after the Jenny Lynn tour is called How Barnum Made His Millions. Barnum wrote 14 books. He was America's first millionaire, brought opera to America, created the Three Ring Circus, coined so many phrases, including the word jumbo. We have jumbo jets and jumbo shrimp because of Barnum. Jumbo was the name of the elephant he created. Much like the White Star Line, the word Titanic didn't exist until then. The word jumbo existed only because it was a creation of Barnum to try to give a word picture of what, how big this elephant people had never was. seen elephants before in the United and, States. And certainly not the size of this animal. Uh, it was an immense animal. And unfortunately, one night, it was Ontario, Canada. Barnum was taking the, uh, not Barnum personally, but his men were taking Jumbo out the back of the circus tent, across the railroad tracks to load him back on the boxcar because they traveled by train. And uh, here comes an unscheduled uh, freight train. And the trainer is trying to push the elephant off the tracks. When the world's largest elephant doesn't want to move, it's not moving. And they all had to stand back and watch this train barrel into oh, Jumbo. Wow. Killed the elephant on impact, derailed the train, killed the engineer. And the question was, who's going to tell Barnum? Uh, Barnum had already had a lot of tragedies in his life. In fact, his autobiography is titled... Uh, struggles and triumphs. And isn't that what all of our lives are? Mm. I think that's part of the human experience to have great wins and great losses and great happiness and, and sadness. It's just part of the human experience to, to go through these things. But he really had highs, highs and lows at, to an extreme, unlike other people. It's one of the reasons I have such a respect for Barnum. He always seemed to overcome a problem. And a good lesson for all of us, uh, when you have a challenge in life, uh, you have a difficulty, instead of tripping over it or giving up, it's use it as a stepping stone. You find a way to use it as a stepping stone. So when Barnum came to the scene and saw Jumbo laying there, the star attraction that's been advertised by the advanced men 
thousands of dollars in that day to advertise this elephant, and it's dead. He had promised the children of the country that the world's largest pet was on its way to their hometown, and that was not going to happen. So he walked up the track. He said, give me a minute, and he disappeared in the dark. And about 20 minutes later, he came back, and he'd hatched a plan. He asked for a large black circus tent to be made to acquire a pump organ uh, that he would need a funeral garb for the, the ladies to wear at the ticket counters, and they would tour the funeral of the world's largest elephant. <laughs> Every taxidermist in the county was there at daybreak. They stuffed the elephant, mounted him to a cart. Barnum donated the skeleton to the Museum of Natural History, where it's still on display. And uh, Barnum later admitted they sold more tickets to see the elephant dead than they were planning on seeing him alive. <laughs> wow. So I found the sheet music from Jumbo's funeral. I don't play the piano, but in this room there's a pump organ. The pump organ, again, like the other instruments, are not battery or electric. By pumping the bellows below the, the organ, it sends air through the pipes. So just like it looks just like a regular piano with the, uh, the ivory and keys. But I'm going to play for you the, uh, the, uh, the theme of an elephant's funeral. Okay. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. See Jumbo, the world's greatest circus tragedy. 25 cents. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> what do you mean you don't play? That's good. <laughs> no, that's it. That's the only song I ever learned. Uh, one of my, my passions with Barnum is his American Museum. Uh, the American Museum was on the corner of Anne and Broadway in New York. It was the first, no exaggeration, the first tourist attraction in the country. People save money all year to go to Disney World. That's how it was in 1800s. You'd save money to go to Barnum's Museum. When Abraham Lincoln was on uh, business in New York, he brought Mary Todd and the boys to the museum. When the Prince of Wales arrived in America, the first thing he said when he stepped foot on our soil, he said, take me to Barnum's. It was the place to see and be seen. Five stories of amazing things. Imagine uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not in that day. Taxidermy of every known animal. Imagine you've never seen a zebra or a giraffe, and there they are. He also mixed in a Fiji mermaid and the unicorn, so you never really quite knew what was Barnum and what was real. Uh, wonderful uh, art and collections. I don't know if any of you collect anything. Of course, a lot of us collect props and magic tricks or even historical magic, antique magic. Barnum collected collections. He hmm. collected collections. So he would buy your collection of magic props or Copperfield's collection of right. antique magic or your baseball collect card collection, whatever it is. So there was truly something for everybody in the museum. Mm -hmm. There would be a butterfly collection next to a armor collection, next to a bisque doll collection, next to a gun collection. There was just an a, a, amazing amount of artifacts and historical things. Edison premiered the talking machine there, the first automatic sewing machine, the cotton gin, uh, there was hot air balloon rides off the roof. There was a live whale in a tank in the basement. The guy was just a mad genius. He charged 25 cents admission. You could spend as much time as you wanted in the museum. And he sold more admissions to the American Museum in three years than the population of the United States of America. And he couldn't get people out of there, which is why he said, see the egress? You got it, yeah. One of my favorite stories, I'm so glad you know that. Sometimes I don't bother to explain that to the public because they just they don't find it as amusing as us performers <laughs> and magicians do. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, Barnum's manager came to him and he said, we have, a, we have a big problem. And Barnum stopped him and said, we don't have problems. We have challenges. What's the challenge? And he said, there's lines down the block. And Barnum said, well, that doesn't sound like a problem to me. And he said, yeah, but we can't get any, we physically can't fit more people in the building. So we're losing revenue. Barnum said, well, you paint these signs and put them through the museum that says this way to the egress. 
and over the back door to the alley, it said, through this door, you'll find Barnum's amazing egress. Well, as we know, egress is a fancy word for exit, but people didn't know that back then. So it became a running joke in, in New York. You're walking down the street, running to a buddy. Hey, Bob, have you been over to Barnum's Museum? No, not lately. Oh, go pay your 25 cents, go in and go straight to the egress. You won't believe what an incredible egress Barnum has. And it just became a, a joke in New York. So yeah, that that's something that all of us entertain entertainers can refer to when when uh, we're doing our dirty work yeah this way to the egress and what year would this have been approximately ish this was 1850s was kind of the heyday of barnum's museum so in this room i have pictures in fact the, this is uh behind me this is the uh only known photograph image of the american museum you can see the lines of people coming out the front door because it's no longer there it is not, and uh, it it just it breaks my heart just hearing you say that because the story I have to tell you um, was very fortunate last October to be given the um, Melbourne Christopher Award, mm -hmm. and that took place in Connecticut. So they flew me to New London, Connecticut. Beautiful evening ceremony, and um, uh, I I stayed in the area for a few days to drive to Bridgeport, which was Barnum's hometown and where he was mayor. There's an autograph here of Barnum when he was mayor of Bridgeport. He is buried in the cemetery that he created. He designed the layout of the cemetery, in fact, the whole town. He's buried right next to Tom Thumb, who was his best friend in life. Tom Thumb, 24 inches tall, head to toe, the smallest man in the world at that time. And um, after my visit to Bridgeport, I had the opportunity, luckily, to meet the curator of the Barnum Museum that's a tribute museum, a historical Barnum Museum in Bridgeport. It's closed because of a hurricane. Uh, long story short, they gave me permission to go in. I got the white gloves and got to go through documents that were, it was just an amazing experience. Now I had the evening free and I decided, you know, I'm only an hour and a half from New York. I've got to go to the corner of Ann and Broadway. So I did. It was in the middle of the night, and of course it's raining. I'm standing on that corner looking at where this this place that I dream. I pray every night to see it in my dreams. It hasn't happened yet, but I just I've got, I just got to go there. I just want to go there. I want to see it. Uh, I have every book on Barnum you can imagine. There was no photography of the inside of the museum, just what I can imagine from the, the drawings. Much like me talking to you right now, where you're using your imagination and visualizing what I'm explaining, that's all I have to go by in trying to imagine what the interior of Barnum's museum was. But I stood there, and um, it was just really... Um, troublesome to stand there and watch the taxis going by and people walking their dogs and on their cell phones and the traffic lights going. No one has any idea what was right here on this corner, but I do. And it what, caught fire or what happened? It time? did. Um, it was July of 1865. Wood in the basement was too close to a boiler, caught fire, literally boiled the whale and brought down the whole building very quickly. And luckily there was no human loss. Uh, but the entire collection was lost. And interesting for the magicians listening, uh, Robert Houdin, who I'm sure all of you know, created many automatons, and the most famous elaborate was the writing automaton. It was on loan to Barnum at the time of the fire and ended up in the rubble. Well, about 10 years ago, a family brought a crate with these charred mechanical pieces to, I, I believe, the Smithsonian might be the Metropolitan Museum, but it was brought to the museum, and after a lot of research and um, restoration, it was the original writing automaton, and it's back working uh, on display. And you can look that up on the internet if any of you live in the area to be able to see it in person. I know that John Gahn has a writing automaton, like Houdini. Writing yes, his, yeah, mm -hmm. the, Houdini writes his right. autograph, mm -hmm. and it's pretty amazing stuff. So from the Pretty Barnum cool. room, I wanted to create um, kind of a feeling of what it was like to go to Barnum's Museum. So although I can't take you to Barnum's Museum, not until I build a time machine, we're going to go to Terry's American Museum. It's a small, feeble attempt to give folks an idea of what it must have been like. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so in this room we find uh, wax figures, uh, several automatons, 
uh, costumes, props from people and magicians from the past. There's cabinets with uh, entertainment relics, an autograph of Charlie Chaplin, things that belong to Siegfried and Roy, uh, Loretta Lynn, Dolly Parton. There's a reproduction genie bottle signed by Barbara Eden, a brick from Lowe's Theater in Atlanta where Gone with the Wind first premiered, a piece of carpet from Graceland, and shoes that were owned and worn by Marilyn Monroe. A lot of just interesting things that everyone can relate to. There's a collection of Farrah Fawcett. It's amazing how many kids today have never heard the name. Farrah Fawcett, uh, the wax figure, was from a museum here in Gatlinburg in the 70s. But in this display, I have one of her hairbrushes, a pair of sunglasses, jewelry, and the costumes in the case were hers also. There's several magician automatons, but one of my prized possessions is there, uh, this collection here. This is a wax figure, a likeness of Harry Blackstone Jr., the first magician that I saw. And at the end of the show was the circus-themed act, mm -hmm. and he wore this yellow tuxedo, and I was able to acquire it after he had passed. There's a unicorn in here, a taxidermy unicorn. Who is this? Oh, there's a wax figure in front of us of a lovely lady. It happens to be Jenny Lind. The curator of the Wax Museum that I know uh, that had this exhibit in the 60s and 70s came to see the house, and when he heard the Barnum stories, he said, I have something for you. Like so many people have been wonderful gifting me things sure. that fit in the house, and he brought me Jenny Lynn. Wow. It, it's, uh, it, I, I, I could write a book on just all the weird coincidences and amazing gifts. I'll give you another example. A woman came to see the house last year, and when she saw this room and the odd collection, she said, I have something I want to donate to the house. This is a picture of the lady I'm talking about. Her name is uh, AJ. She was there the day the Berlin Wall came down, and she brought me a piece of the Berlin Wall and a piece of the barbed wire from, from mm -hmm. Berlin. When she went to sign the guest book, she asked what the date was, and I told her it was November 11th, and, uh, and she started to cry. She gave me the piece of the Berlin Wall on the anniversary of the Berlin Wall coming down. Wow. Just stuff like that. Amazing. There's a, a, a business card, uh, which is also called a, it's like a sepia tone picture of John Wilkes Booth. It's um, uh, what they call a cabinet card, but they were often used as calling cards. On the back of this picture is John Wilkes Booth's theatrical agent's contact information. So what I explained to guests and is really kind of chilling, I can guarantee you beyond a shadow of a doubt, the finger that pulled the trigger on Abraham Lincoln held that. Right. And you got a picture of Lincoln right in front of that then, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, got a few rabbits here. Yeah, there's a couple a rabbits. A wall of rabbits. Uh, there's 216 rabbit and hat figurines. Uh, and what I love about this collection is not the size of the collection, but what this tells me is 200, over 200 artists thought enough about magic, thought enough about our art to make a permanent representation of it. These took sculptors or painters and designers and manufacturers, and someone bought it, someone sold it, and it ended up here. That's what's interesting now that I you, know, you say that, because, Terry, that it, they're not just rabbits, but they are depictions of rabbits doing magic in a hat or with a magician. So every one is related to magic. It's magic. not like an Easter bunny. I mean, Correct. these are all magic bunnies. All specifically, there's uh, magic banks, uh, Christmas ornaments, salt and pepper shakers, uh, water pitchers, coffee cups, uh, just a, a little bit of everything you can imagine that could be done as a design of a magician. The next room I want to take you into is the chapel here at Magic Mansion. This is the only room in the house where you can see the original floors, walls, and ceilings exactly as it was in 1840. They've not been redone. Nothing has been redone. When I pulled the paneling and carpet up, I can't tell you it was like Christmas morning to come in here and see everything exactly as it was. Um, so this room is laid out like a, a chapel with stained glass windows that came out of my home church in St. Charles. So this is really a great place to, to reflect on life and be thankful as we all should for the blessings that we have. You know, I tell people in the show and in the house tour in this room that, you know, really we know life is a gift, no matter where you think it came from, that's your business, but life is a gift. We've all been given health, happiness, family, friends, food, shelter, and freedom. If you live in America. So these are all things that I know about all of you listening 
uh, even though we've never met. You have these wonderful blessings, and it's how we appreciate and use them that makes our life magic. I truly think that if we live with a grateful heart, if we truly, if you can live with a grateful heart for the things that you have, you will find true magic. It is the true magic of life to live with a thankful heart. And by living in the now, that's why they call it the present, because it is a present. Yes. Watch your step here. The house changes seasonally. Um, We have the the haunted house runs the month of October and the Christmas version of the house uh, weekends in December. So a lot of the displays change over the year. There's areas that I can customize for the seasons. So the space that we're in currently is a life-size wax uh, exhibit of the nativity. And um, it's kind of funny because I had to create the scene out of wax heads that I had in the collection. So the three kings are, <laughs> you'll see them now when, you, when I tell you who is they are. Is that Washington back there? It is. We have <laughs> Washington, uh, Chung Ling Su, and Trump. <laughs> so those are the three, <laughs> the three, the kings. three okay. wise men, yes. And uh, Judas here is represented by a wax head from Christus Gardens, the religious wax museum that was in Gatlinburg until COVID closed down it and so many things, unfortunately. But the the, Jude, the the Joseph head is actually Judas from the Last Supper scene. Wow. And get ready. There's uh, Mary, of course, is on the opposite side of uh-huh. the manger. I didn't have a female face that wasn't all dolled up, you know, with a Hollywood look. So I'm thinking, what can I use for her? I found, we used to do the girl without a middle trick. Sure, of course. <laughs> but I got in the box. So it was Terry without a middle. So, so you had to have a face. I had a life cast made of uh-huh. myself with the eyes closed. So the the Mary the face of Mary is me from high school. That's why I look so, somewhat familiar. <laughs> yeah, I, I am officially the Virgin Terry. That's how this. You know, works. at first glance, it looked kind of like Ray Anderson. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a lot of religious relics, and then we go into the Disney collection. Uh, a lot of Magic Mickey's, much like the other display of figurines, but specifically, there were so many Mickey's that it created its own collection. Some of these things were given to me by, like this one, um, was given to me on my 20-year anniversary here in Pigeon Forge by a Disney Imagineer, who's a friend of mine. So we're going to head into the next room, which is the miniature train room. And uh, Wow. Yeah, tell tell everyone what you're seeing. Okay, what I'm seeing in here, it looks like this is a a converted garage almost, uh, where it uh, is the walls are black and it's got uh, some lights in the ceiling, making it look like stars. Up against the uh, back of the room over there is a luminescent full moon, and also see a castle. But then uh, on the table in front of us, just imagine something about the size of a couple of ping pong tables, I guess, basically about that size. I see there's a you can hear the railroad the. the the train that's going around the choo-choo and it's got a village it looks like a Christmas scene in which there are a lot of Christmas trees and as he dims the lights then he has the black lights that are hitting everything and illuminating everything uh, giving it a, a kind of a Christmas glow to it gives you a feeling of joy of a child playing with the toys here wow so this is the amusement park in my mind. You've heard of Dollywood here in Pigeon Forge. This is Evanswood. <laughs> it's a, kind of a dream amusement park laid out much like Disney World with the Main Street, turn of the century Main Street. And all my favorite things are finally in one spot. Barnum's Museum is in the corner of Main Street. There's a Western area. I love Westerns. County Fair with the, where the flea market was that I grew up with. Uh, the Titanic display, a lot of Disney references like the castle, and a whole land of miniature haunted houses. Uh, You know I'm a haunted house fan. So in that area I call Haunted Hollow, we find the Psycho Mansion, the Adams Family, the Munster's House, a miniature haunted mansion from Disney. Wow. And speaking of the Munster's House, last year Butch Patrick showed up at my show. Uh, Of course he played uh, Eddie on the Munster's. And he, uh, he wanted to see the house. So Eddie Munster and I took the tour of the house. And when he saw I was building a model of the Munster's house, he asked for a Sharpie and signed the roof. So it's just fun little, little Easter eggs, uh, <laughs> as we call them, as guests go through the house. Wow. Pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal. Man, 
a lot of fun. Okay, now as we are leaving that, we're going through we're going into an archway here <laughs> into a haunted house area. Yes, in the haunted house. This is the collection of Disney's um, haunted mansion items. Uh, there are props that were used in the haunted mansion that are here. As, as some of you may, may remember in the beautiful uh, Pepper's Ghost effect mm -hmm. where the skulls are floating out of the pipe organ at the end of the ballroom, one of the skulls is here and actually a, a, a authentic doom buggy front, oh. a doom buggy car front is here. Uh, I've been collecting Disney for a long time. I, I had the opportunity when I performed, the first year I performed at the Magic Castle in Hollywood, uh, I had been in touch with a man by the name of Xavier Intensio. He is one of the original nine animators for Walt Disney. He came to see the show. We had dinner after, and he told me firsthand stories of sitting across the desk working with Walt Disney, and what a treat that was. Uh, when I built the haunted house, I, I've written two poems in my life. Uh, that always seems to happen if I'm passionate about something. Sure. It comes out in words. And this might be a great opportunity for the listeners uh, to hear this where I really don't bother with this on the public tour because it's it's just not the same when you're when you're just standing talking sure. but I think it's a great opportunity can please, I can uh, I read you my do. haunted house yes, poem? please do okay when I built the haunted house it wasn't about blood and guts we get enough of that on the news every night my haunted house much like Disney was family friendly just ghosts and skeletons no Freddy Krueger chainsaws it was truly, if a house was haunted, there wouldn't be monsters in it. It's haunted. So I wanted to capture that feeling in words, and it went like this. The House on the Hill. Would you spend the night in the house on the hill, where the cat has long left from the windowsill? You enter the past like unsealing a tomb when you open the doors of a once locked room where the walls cry and the doorways moan and the floorboards creak, though there's no one home. If the walls could only talk as they oftentimes do, they'd share this haunting tale with you of a time gone by, of days that were few, of loves long lost, once said to be true. You stand in the present, invading the past, of lives that were lived too mortal to last. As the candle flicker at the end of the hall, cast shadows of the spider who weaves on the wall. The amber glow of the moon shone so bright on the owl who hoots in the cold, lonely night. The wind blows the curtains all tattered and torn. The chandeliers sway and now seem to mourn. For the ballroom is empty, the dancers have gone. The organ stopped playing its once happy song. Where laughter and music the air did once fill, the presence now felt of a cold, ghostly chill, as unwelcome as you in the house on the hill. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and what's crazy, this house sitting on the hill, 20 years later after writing that poem, every line of it fits now. It here. does. We are on it, a hill right it, here. Yes, yeah. and, and all of it, uh, including the cat, i got to tell you about. So we're going to head into the circus sideshow room. Okay. So that looks like a poster that you uh, had made. So do you sell those posters with the we, poem we, on we, that too? We don't, but a lot of people have suggested that I you do should. that. Uh, in this room we're entering, it's like you're going into the old circus sideshow with the sideshow barker doing his hurry, hurry, hurry. hurry, hurry. hurry. <laughs> Above your head there's a mermaid, a life-size mermaid. So... We're passing by a collection of oddities, including shrunken heads, uh, the Fiji mermaid, piranhas, a two-headed raccoon. Uh, this is the dead cat I found under the house. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was running electric under the dining room to bring power to the far wall for the wall sconces and came face to face with a complete, perfectly mummified cat. And most people would have been mortified, and I was thrilled because I got a free exhibit <laughs> for my sideshow room. Of course, you can't be complete without a jackalope. I was going to say, is that a jackalope? It's a jackalope. <laughs> yeah. That is an alien baby from the Roswell accident. Behind us is the raccoon fish, half raccoon, half fish. I'm just imagining two taxidermists, you know, one night having too many beers and just <laughs> what can we glue together. And an extra martini, I think, That's on that right. one is what they had there. There's a two-bodied duckling and the vampire rat from Transylvania. Uh, I tell kids, you know, the vampire rat, it's a, a very large, oversized rat with huge fangs. Well, this also is a funny story. I found this 
it's a squirrel, a, a squirrel mummified that I found in the attic of my last house. And standing upright and with a few raccoon fangs glued in it, mm-hmm. it sure looks like a vampire it rat does. now. <laughs> it does. There's a, a dragon skull, the last dragon sl- slain by um, St. George, and a fish person from the lost city of Atlantis. And here's a story I want to share that I never tell because only magicians would appreciate it. We're looking at at the fish person. It is a shriveled up, mummified, kind of looks like, in a way, a bat. Um, I don't know what it would look like to you, but a mascot, mo- mascot moth, or yeah, something. The, yeah, kind of a <laughs> yeah, big, a big moth. I'd seen these as a kid at our county fairs, and always just wondered what it was. Every year, one of the sideshows would have one. When I first arrived at the Magic Castle, Milt Larson was walking me through, and we went downstairs to look at some of the exhibits, and there he had one. And I said, Milt, finally I get an answer, because I know it was a living thing, Mm -hmm. but what I couldn't tell you. And I said, you know, ever since my childhood, I would see these, and finally you're the man that can tell me what this is. The founder? I said, this is the last mystery I have. And he said, well... I'm not going to tell you what it is. Hmm. And I said, why? And he said, because, Terry, you just told me it was the last mystery you have, and I'm not going to tell you if that's what you're believing to be the last mystery. We should keep it that way. So So that's the only thing in the world you don't know. (laughs) Well, the only thing I don't know in my own collection. I'm uh, working on right now a miniature girl to gorilla illusion. Yep. Uh, when you pass, the motion sensor kicks on and the effect takes place, and uh, a female mannequin will turn into a gorilla. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. I know. I hate to leave you hanging like that, but we are only about, well, a little bit more than halfway through. Next week, we're going to complete our tour with our tour guide, Terry Evanswood. And after the tour, he's going to sit down with us in the theater and chat a little bit more. I know that you're going to enjoy next week's episode then as well. Well, at the beginning of this episode, I told you about the contest that we are running, and I recommend that you go to themagicwordpodcast.com, and there you will see an entry form where you put in your name and email address, and that will populate the database or spreadsheet that I have, and then this will run for this week and next week, and you have an opportunity to have your name randomly drawn for an opportunity to win one of two ebooks or one physical book. Now, this is open to the world, wherever legally permitted. I guess by law <laughs> to have a contest. Uh, anyhow, if you will again fill this out, and if you live anywhere outside the U.S. and your name or email is drawn, then the ebook will be sent to you. If you live outside of the U.S., you will not receive the physical copy of the book, but you will get the ebook. And if you live in the U.S., uh, there is a possibility that uh, if all three who are who names are drawn from the U.S., two will receive an ebook, one will. will will receive a physical book. I think you get the general idea. Again, it's open to the world, so please go to the com for this week's episode and complete that form. This contest is going to run for a couple of weeks, but I implore you to enter soon. Not often. That means only one name and email. Not just one email, but one name per entrant. So please just enter once, even if you have two or three different emails, uh, just uh, enter one time. And if your name is randomly drawn, then you could be the winner. So, anyhow, this has gone a little bit long this week, and we have another one next week that's going to be a little bit long then as well. So, until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to appreciate the present. You must first appreciate the past. This is Scotty out. Scotty out.